Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ernie Bagnuolo, representing Win Ultra Health Performance Center. I'm honored uh, to have been chosen to present a talk regarding heart health, and I have chosen something a little bit different, I hope for many, something called heart rate variability. And what I'll be dis discussing is what heart rate variability is and why does it matter to us regarding our overall health. So a little bit about me now. I was born and raised in Niagara Falls and returned to begin my chiropractic career. I am currently in my 19th year of practice and I maintain a multidisciplinary clinic here in Niagara Falls. It is um, something I'm proud of because we employ physiotherapists, chiropractors, naturopaths, osteopaths, massage therapists. So we truly are a multidisciplinary clinic and we strive to be a performance center not just a clinic associated with any one of those disciplines. Over the years, my special interests have evolved from sports injuries, which are still an interest, but I've grown as we all do through the course of a career. And I became more interested in how we can make ourselves more resilient, how we can make ourselves healthier, both mind and body. And that has diversified into becoming interested into something known as neuro or biohacking to improve human capabilities. And with the improvement of technology and the introduction of different techniques and devices, biohacking and um, its results have become something that are um, very interesting. And I think many people can take advantage of to improve their overall health. One of the facets of neurohacking or biohacking uh, is heart rate variability, which may be a new term to some, and for others, it may be something that they've been aware of for some time now. It's becoming a more popular term as wearable technology has become more popular because a lot of devices out there do measure this, which we'll get into later on in this talk. But by definition, heart rate variability is the measurement of time between each individual heartbeat. So on an ECG, the RR interval, as noted here in this graph, is the amount of time between those peaks is what's considered our heart rate in milliseconds. And when it's more variable, so when it's not exactly one second per, um, or per beat or 60 beats per minute is not exactly one second, then we are considered to be in a certain amount of heart rate variability. And that is something that is desirable. Although we may think having a variable heart rate is not desirable, that is definitely not so. A less variable heart rate is something that would indicate poorer health. So as I mentioned, if a heart beats at 60 beats per minute, therefore it can be assumed that it beats at one time per second. But if it beats at exactly one second, um, then this would be an example of poor heart rate variability because it's not variable at all. But if it beats at 1.5 seconds, then 0 0.95 seconds, then 0 0.7, then 1.3, this is considered good heart rate variability and is much more desirable because it means that we are in a healthier state of being and something I'll discuss or try to explain in the following slides. So as I mentioned, a more variable heart rate is preferred and a well-documented indicator of our stress levels and general health status. So how is heart rate variability and the nervous system, how are they related? Because it's truly um, the nervous system that makes our heart beat and it's the way that our nervous system's state is quantified, which is the heart rate variability. So what I mean by that is the more variable our heart rate, as I mentioned, the healthier we are, which also means our nervous system is in a state of healthy being. So to understand what that means, we have to understand how the heart rate is controlled. And that is through the automatic or autonomic is the uh, proper term. The autonomic nervous system controls our heart. So you do not think about it voluntarily. It just happens automatically and it beats. 
And when we need it to be faster, it does. When we need it to be slower, it does. And the way that those rates are controlled is through a subdivision of that autonomic nervous system, one called the sympathetic or the SNS, which is responsible for what we would call fight or flight, a term we may have been familiar with. So sweating, flushing, increased breath rates or breathing rates, um, that's all under direct influence of our fight and flight portion of our automatic nervous system known as the sympathetic nervous system. Whereas our next um, part of the the autonomic nervous system, our PNS or parasympathetic nervous system, that's known as our rest and digest system that controls uh, breathing, digestion, sleep, um, to just name a few. But that is what keeps us under a uh, grounded, controlled state. So similar to what we probably are right now, just listening to this talk. Uh, so if we're listening to this talk, we're calm, we're relaxed, our parasympathetic system is in full effect. But if our smoke detector goes off and a fire is going off in our house somewhere, you jump out of our chair, you start you know, frantically running around, your heart rate increases, you may start to sweat. Um, that would be considered fight and flight. So that's how quickly it can shift and change just depending on the stimulus of the world around us. So when at rest, our heart rate is controlled by our PNS. Then during heavy cardiovascular exercise, our heart rate shifts to being controlled by our sympathetic nervous system or SNS. But it's what happens in between that shift that directly impacts our heart rate variability. So when we begin exercising, and I use this example because it's the easiest one for most of us to relate to, we don't just shift from rest to flight. So my heart rate now is beating very calm and comfortably at let's say 60 beats per minute. But if I get up and I just start to do a light jog, I don't all of a sudden transition from rest to flight just in a matter of a second. It's a process. So I use this picture below of this thumb holding down this person and um, what happens is that thumb pushes down at the beginning under rest. And as it starts to relax or release, our, our parasympathetic nervous system is still in control until that thumb completely lets go. So our thumb is completely in control until it no longer has contact with that person below. So the process of letting go is still a rest and digest or parasympathetic process until we reach that tipping point where then it just no longer has any control and that sympathetic nervous system takes over. So it's, it's well known that the more we can control our heart rate in that process of transition by keeping it under a parasympathetic or rest and digest state while it transitions to this fight and flight state, the better our nervous system is adapted to any activity and the healthier we are considered to be. So as I mentioned, as we exercise, our PNS control lessens, and this causes our heart rate to rise, but it may be quickly for some and slowly for others. This is variable. The lower we keep our heart rate under higher intensity exercise, the better. But once we succumb to the sympathetic nervous system or the powers of that um, nervous system of fight and flight, our heart rate elevates quickly and steadily, becoming less variable. And the reason that it's less variable is because as we start to demand more from our body, then we have to be efficiently and almost exactly to deliver what our working tissues need to carry out any type of activity that's now demanded upon them. So therefore, the more at rest we are or calm we are, the more our heart rate is controlled by a parasympathetic nervous system or our rest and digest system. 
and this means it will be more variable. There's a certain window of play that is allowed before our sympathetic nervous system takes over and heart rate no longer becomes variable. But let's move away from this exercise example because this was only an explanation of the nervous system that we cannot control. It's not how our heart rate variability is truly observed. For that, we really have to look at rest, not exercise. So heart rate variability, since it is better when we are in a calm, relaxed state, it's better measured in a calm, relaxed state when our parasympathetic nervous system is fully engaged. Are we able to demonstrate then what we would like to see when we are at rest? And that is 1.5 milliseconds is one beat, 0 0.95 is another. We don't want to see exactly one beat per second for 60 minutes or 60 seconds, sorry. Um, so we want it to be variable, 1.5, 0 0.95, 0 1.3, 0 0.7, and so on. The more variability, the better. There's a term that we often come across, uh, and it helps us determine this heart rate variability being high or low, and that's considered our intrinsic heart rate value, to throw another term at you, one that's really quite simple and easy, but it's the term used for the heart rate as if it were to be beating without any influence or void of any influence of our nervous system at all. So no rest and digest, no fight or flight. It's just a hypothetical example of our heart rate beating and used as a measure. And that measure is to determine whether we have a high or low heart rate variability. And to determine that, the intrinsic heart rate value is considered to be 100 beats per minute. And that's kind of the set beat per minute that's out there as if there was no sympathetic or fight and flight, and there was no parasympathetic or rest and digest. And we just have a heartbeat going on its own without any influence of the nervous system. And that is said to be a beat of 100 beats per minute. That is what's considered intrinsic heart rate value. And the reason that the intrinsic heart rate value is important is because it sets a standard of how we can get close to that. So we say 100 beats per minute, but in terms of heart rate variability, we just choose the number one, 1 1.0. So the higher or the closer you get to 1.0, the more healthy state of being you are in. You are in a better state of parasympathetic tone. This is a personal number. So a 20 year old male and a 60 year old male that would otherwise be identical other than their age, obviously this is hypothetical, would have completely heart rate or different heart rate variability scores because just by being youthful and younger, the 20 year old will have a much higher heart rate variability score. So the lower heart rate variability number means that you are living in some form of stress, whether it be lifestyle stress, illness, or otherwise. This is also only known once you have baseline values of a few weeks. So what we mean by this is you can't just wear a piece of tech or determine your heart rate variability being high or low by measuring it for one or two nights. You have to have some kind of set base value. So usually it needs to be monitored or measured for a period of weeks to a few months and then know what your norms are. So my norm may be uh, 50 milliseconds or 50, let's just say, uh, and if that's my highest I could possibly ever achieve, then if I'm running at 48, 49, 50, that's considered high heart rate variability for me. But if I know that 50 is my norm, and then I wake up in the morning and I only hit 22, I know I'm not in a good state of being and that my sympathetic state or my fight and flight state is taking over and I'm not considered to be in an optimal state of neurological being. So I don't have good heart rate variability that night.
So now that you've determined you have a high or low heart rate variability because you've determined your normative values, what does that mean? So if you have a high heart rate variability and you're in a good state of neurological being, usually you're eating well and sleeping well and you sleep deeply. You don't eat or drink two hours prior to bedtime or longer. You train and recover properly. As I mentioned, you eat well. You don't play on any of your devices, phones, computers at least one hour prior to sleep so your brain can shut down from those blue lights. You use meditation as part of your life, deep breathing techniques, cold showers or alternating between hot and cold in the shower. You're avoiding excessive alcohol and drugs and generally youth. Lower heart rate variability are those who have a poor state of neurological health, generally have poor nutrition habits, poor sleep habits, have some form of illness, for example, COVID. Um, one of the wearable devices used the um, heart rate variability numbers that were recorded and they were submitting those numbers to a study to determine what heart rate variability would do prior or if it could determine whether COVID was um, a possibility due to differences in, in heart rate variability scores. And then for those that did test positive for COVID, they looked at their heart rate variability four or five days prior to symptoms and tested to see if there was an actual change from what their norms would be. Really interesting, especially given uh, the, you know, the state of the world these days, but this could really be applied to even other illnesses and other um, uh, states of, of, of uh, poor health outside of COVID. Increased stress levels, whether it be work, home, school, alcohol intake, drug intake, extremes in temperatures, travel. Um, and when I, I say travel, I mean not just the process itself, but crossing time zones, which would then uh, influence and affect our sleeping habits and potentially our eating habits. Overtraining, um, meaning that you're not taking the proper recovery needed or you have high, high intensity workouts. And then those workouts um, basically translate to, to poor sleep habits or poor eat habits, or you're just metabolically in a state where you're, you're still trying to recover from that uh, training session and your heart rate variability is a good indicator that you're still not fully recovered from that. Uh, we'll discuss a little bit more of that uh, in further slides as well. Eating or drinking too close to bedtime and just being of an older age. When I say older or uh, more youthful, those are not set in stone. Those numbers are variable. So uh, you could be 60 and be youthful. You can be 60 and be not youthful. So everyone's a little bit different uh, there as well. So I mentioned earlier that overtraining was one of the ways that we could use heart rate variability to determine whether we are fully recovered to continue on intense uh, training uh, or that, uh, or, or we need longer periods of time to recover. So for years, cardiovascular training and progress was measured via just our resting heart rate. We would find those norms, look at our resting heart rate. And if our resting heart rate was higher in the morning when we measured, then it determined that we were overtraining. But um, we've learned that resting heart rate was not the best way to determine overtraining as we learned more about the heart rate variability and its neurological influences from our automatic or our autonomic nervous system. We realized that heart rate variability was a better gauge of whether we were overtrained or not. And that most athletes started to dismiss just their morning heart rates and look a little deeper at their heart rate variability as a truer sense of overtraining. So if heart rate variability is lower than the norms, it's clear that an individual is under stress and trying to repair the tissue and metabolic processes associated with overtraining. And if heart rate variability remains at the expected higher value, then we can assume one is in good health and under less sympathetic tone or stress and recovered so they can continue their training program as if they are completely under a, a um, metabolic perfection, so to speak, or metabolically efficient to continue and uh, tax their system. So now that we have a better understanding of heart rate variability and the nervous system's influences on heart rate variability, 
here's a good example of how you can demonstrate some of the influences of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems just on our own general well-being just by using our breathing patterns and inspiring and expiring so if we can find our um, pulses so you can either use your neck or your wrist and just kind of find your pulse rate and just feel the uh, pulse beat so you get a sense of the pulse rate and take a big breath in so inspire deeply and hold your breath and as you inspire and hold that breath you are activating your sympathetic nervous system and you should feel your pulse rate increase once you determine that exhale slowly and you should now activate not you should you are now activating your parasympathetic nervous system and your pulse rate should actually start to decrease again. So these are how, uh, or as a clear example of how our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems affect something that we almost take for granted. We automatically breathe because without it, we wouldn't be alive. And it can influence the, um, the pulse rate just like you felt in that example there. So very simply, this is a good way to demonstrate the neurological influences. However, there is no way for you to determine the difference between 1.5 and 0.95 seconds when you're breathing in and out if there's even a change in your heart rate variability. So we really need something more advanced or something a little bit greater to, um, to determine what our heart rate variability is and give us a value so that we can demonstrate it and determine whether we need to correct our lifestyle or our habits. So this is my favorite part. How can you calculate your heart rate variability? Anybody who knows me knows I have an affinity for tech and the newest and latest gadgets for better or for worse. But this is one of the times I like to think it's for the better because it's a way to help to me to determine my health. And this is something that I've um, worked on and um, purchased a couple of these devices to try and evaluate whether I am in a good state of neurological well-being and whether I have a high or low heart rate variability. So one of the most common ones that we all see is in this picture here is the Apple Watch. The Apple Watch does have an algorithm built into it that determines heart rate variability, as do most Garmin's and some of the higher end Fitbits. Those are the three, so the three bottom ones on this list here, those are the three that we most commonly are aware of. But the top three here that are called Aura Ring, Whoop Band, or Biostrap are generally considered a better or higher standard for determining heart rate variability as that's what these were designed for. They are designed to be lifestyle straps and monitors and heart rate variability and sleeping patterns are a big part of how and why they work well. The best way is an ECG or an electrocardiogram but most of us don't have one of those units in our home and it's not really efficient to hook ourselves up to machines with straps and stickers and trying to determine a value night after night. So we rely on these uh, small pieces of tech that have evolved and are actually quite good. I'm an owner of the Aura Ring and an Apple Watch and I definitely prefer the Aura Ring uh, as far as heart rate and variability uh, measurements are concerned and sleep habits. And the reason being is because I wear it to sleep. It's meant to be worn to sleep. Whereas now my Apple Watch charges at night and uh, is not a good way of determining heart rate variability when it's on a charger. But not only that, even if I were to wear it at night, the algorithms built, built into these devices, so the Aura Ring, the Whoop Band, the Biostrap, they measure on a much more frequent uh, basis and are a little bit more accurate at determining true values of sleep and heart rate variability. That doesn't mean the others aren't effective or good, uh, it just matters if you really want to kind of good, better, best, basically, because if you're comparing apples to apples, then it works. If you're comparing apples to oranges, then the comparison doesn't work. So um, uh, these are some of the, the tech straps that are out there that help to determine our heart rate variability. And in the uh, in the next slide, I'll show you what those whoop band and the aura, aura ring look like. Um, the whoop band is meant to be worn mostly all the time, all day activity. The Aura Ring would be uh, more of a sleeping aid or something to be worn with a, during a more sedentary or a non-heavy weight lifting um, uh, exercise routine because you wouldn't lift weights with this ring on or else it would break. And I'll show you that below. So the two pictures here, the first one is a whoop band 
And that's actually a free device. If you go to Whoop Band's website, uh, you can get it for free, but you do have to pay a monthly membership, I think, of around 40 or so dollars Canadian. And the Aura Ring below, I think, is a $290 purchase, and there is a $6 a month membership. Basically, it, it connects you to a community of like-minded people. You can compare and contrast your values, discuss ways of improving um, some of the findings, and try to overall make yourself healthier. It, it is a really cool concept to have these communities out there. Both of them work through the nighttime and have excellent batteries of over uh, five to seven days. But one of the key factors is, or that I really liked is, because one of the influences that I didn't discuss actually, and it was, I should have, was the uh, uh, near field communication, Wi-Fi networks, all of those electronics that are around us, those two are known to affect our heart rate variability or affect our sleeping habits. So with these devices, you can actually turn off Bluetooth and near field, near field communications, um, NFC, and you can still get recordings at night and then upload it when you decide whether it's one, two, three days later, and you turn on those um, near field communications in the middle of the day when you're not sleeping. So that's always a, um, an excellent habit as well. Um, the Aura Ring is something I do own and I speak highly of and would recommend. And the Apple Watch is, as an exercise device is excellent too. But as far as heart rate variability, I do think you get a better reading from the Aura Ring. And um, it's just one of the devices out there. And it, I would, uh, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it because it's one also one of the first devices out there. I think they're on their third generation now as well. Whoop Band is on its fourth generation. So these are these are devices that have been designed specifically to calculate heart rate variability, help one improve their overall health, their sleeping habits, and um, generally become a better person and a, a better version of themselves. So what are some of the ways that we use heart rate variability in our clinic? Well, um, it, it's a practical measurement. So uh, we use it for pain control, digestive issues, uh, post-concussion injuries, anxiety, or any really mental health um, disease, um, post-operative health, general wellness. It can be used in so many ways. Uh, general wellness kind of blankets the other five that I put up there, but those are just a few. So um, for example, with pain control, if someone's in chronic pain and they do everything right, which is almost impossible because usually if you do everything right, your pain will go down. But if you're in a state of pain, even if it's a new pain or a, a chronic older pain, generally your nervous system is not considered to be in a healthy or great state. Heart rate variability will be poor. We can use wearables. Some people are inclined to buy a device just to do anything they can to get out of these uh, episodes of pain, or they already own one, such as the Apple Watch, and we use heart rate variability as a measure of improvement. So it allows for an objective measurement as well to improve your overall well being and nervous system. Uh, digestive issues and GI health. This is huge. We have so many people coming in that have issues with their gut and GI system from poor GI motility to poor absorption to just general pain or food intolerances. And for many times we can use elimination diets to uh, eliminate foods and see if that works, but we can also eliminate foods and see if heart rate variability goes up because that's another indication. Now, there's also many factors, but it's one way of determining of our, our nervous system, in this case, rest and digest, if it's actually working optimally. And when it is, these issues tend to get better or improved. Uh, Post-concussion injury definitely works uh, well in that. It's used all the time because heart rate variability goes, um, goes awry when you have an injury such as this. Um, anxiety, post-operative health. Post-operative health is big because the procedure itself of the surgery and the anesthetic that's used are generally a traumatic process. Surgery, cutting is trauma. The anesthetic is a toxin our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system will respond. Those which we cannot control. The higher our parasympathetic tone, the better we are. Generally right after, we have poor parasympathetic tone and high sympathetic tone, and we have poor heart rate variability. We can measure the progress as we get better and watch our heart rate variability get better. And some tips, we've already discussed a little bit, but some tips to improve heart rate variability. 
um, besides the ones that we can't control, like our age and genetics, hydration is a big one. Making hydration a priority and increasing our water intake can have a drastic effect on heart rate variability. Uh, dehydration or increased caffeine, increased alcohol, those all affect our heart rate variability for the, on the negative side. We become um, less optimum and have a poorer heart rate variability. So the general rule of thumb is trying to drink half of your body weight in pounds, in ounces. So what that means is if you're 200 pounds, you drink 100 ounces of water. Uh, you can also try and schedule recovery days from exercise. So as I mentioned, too much strenuous exercise can leave you in a state of metabol metabolic disarray and beat up and run down. So you, you can't run marathons every day and expect to be in good metabolic state. Your body cannot recover. We can't put that kind of demand on our system on a daily basis without giving it a proper rest. So the... Um, the heart rate variability will drop in a case like this if we take some rest and recovery, proper nutrition as a number three, making healthy choices. I'm not here to talk about what diets are good and which diets are not good. That's individualized based on your, your needs, but proper diet, proper recovery, proper nutrition, hydration are a um, surefire way to improve your heart rate variability. Consistency in life. So scheduling consistencies from workouts to sleeping to meals to work habits, anything that you can do regimented, especially as it revolves around sleeping and eating, because those are primal. Um, I, I, I tend to joke, eating, sleeping, and um, bowel movement. So eat, sleep, poop. That brings us right back to us being a baby and really the only three things that matter when we are in our infant state and we're dependent on our parents as we are um, being nurtured. But those primal um, uh, functions and needs are what truly need to happen. And when those are working just fine and we get enough good nutrition, enough sleep and enough GI motility, we tend to have better heart rate variability. And then lastly, meditation and mindfulness. If we can actually take time from our day to disassociate from our stresses on a mental level, Take time, close your eyes, meditate, visualize yourself being the person you want to be, just kind of getting away from your state of being. So if you're in pain, visualize yourself what you look like out of pain. If you're working too much, visualize yourself, yourself working more optimally or the way you would truly like to be. It can be anything, but meditate and visualize a better person of you that can make a huge influence on your heart rate variability and the state of your nervous system. Again, very um, uh, minimal list, but just, these are just some of the ways that you can try to improve yourself. We can get into all kinds of different things here as well, but um, generally we're trying to keep it simple for, for a talk like this. And that brings us to the end of this discussion on heart rate variability. I'd like to thank the listeners and um, Heart Niagara for having me on to do a, a quick talk. I really enjoyed this. Heart rate variability is something that I'm um, trying to master myself and I, I check it daily. And I encourage you all to do the same if you're inclined. If you have questions or comments, please email me at that email address below. That is a direct link to me and I'd be more than happy to hear from any of you. I hope you were all able to learn something and learn how heart rate variability is different from heart rate and how heart rate variability is a excellent way to measure our overall health, state of well-being, and our ability to kind of manipulate ourselves to be a better version of ourselves. Thank you all. I look forward to hearing from you and I wish you all a wonderful family day weekend.